Good afternoon and welcome to our Tuesday webinar organised by Glasgow Chamber of Commerce with me, Russell Walker. Thanks to everyone who has joined us today. There's, uh, oh, just approaching 50 at the moment, which is great. So it's becoming increasingly clear how damaging the coronavirus pandemic could be for organisations of all sizes and sectors. So today, I am delighted to welcome onto the webinar two business leaders who have been at the sharp end of the impact of the pandemic even longer than we have. They're both members of the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce 1783 Presidents Network. The first is Sharon Riley. She's a managing partner of employment law firm Riley and Tesoro. Many of you will know Sharon. Um, she's Scottish and moved to Italy 25 years ago. Her firm works across a, a huge range of industry sectors, including pharma, uh, infotech, hospitality, luxury retail, and manufacturing. Her listing in the prestigious Legal 500 directory says, um, Sharon provides excellent strategic guidance and innovative solutions to complex business problems. So I guess that could come in very handy right now. Uh, Glasgow's Chambers Association with Northern Italy is uh, long and precious to them. There are partnerships with the British Chamber of Commerce for Italy, the Italian Chambers of Commerce UK, and since Glasgow is twinned with Turin, there's also a very close relationship with that city's Chamber of Commerce. So I'm also thrilled another Scot living in Italy is with us. John A. Stewart is a managing partner at European law firm Field Fisher, uh, and he's been vice president of the British Chamber of Commerce for Italy since 2016. John's had a, a stellar business career specializing in public accounting, uh, receivership, tax, and valuations. His bio also intriguingly says he's been involved in numerous special assignments, which all sounds a bit James Bond. Perhaps most interestingly right now though, John is also chairman of Airport Handling SPA, which is the company that provides uh, baggage, check-in, uh, and ramp service at Milan's two airports. So he will be only too aware of the damage this pandemic is causing to all sectors of business, particularly aviation. So welcome to you both. We've got lots of questions from people on the webinar, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. If you are here online, uh, it's not too late to, to put a question in. Just raise your hand. I think that's the, the right uh, box uh, on, on the right side of your screen. Uh, or just type a comment um, into the comment box and I'll get around to as many of you as I can. Okay, so firstly to you, Sharon, um, are there any signs things might be starting a slow recovery in Italy? Okay, so Alan, first of all, hello and thank you very much to yourself and, and to the Glasgow Chamber for this invitation. And although the, the circumstances are unfortunate, it's lovely to be speaking virtually to an audience of, of fellow Scots. You know, I'm Glasgow born and bred, um, but Italian by marriage. So, you know, we're into our fifth week of a full national lockdown. Um, so that started on the 9th of March. The numbers are still staggering, as you'll probably all have seen. You know, we have over 16,500 deaths to date in Italy and 132,500 um, cases, you know, people who, are, who have the, the, the coronavirus disease. We are seeing a bit of, we've seen a plateau and we're seeing the trend slightly on the downward curve. But I think, you know, we're still waiting with bated breath to see if that continues. And indeed, we get um, it's probably the highest television ratings in Italy. Every day at six o'clock, we have the Civil Protection Agency who come on and give us very clear um, and thorough statistics. And we also have the Chief Medical Officer you know, uh, talking about you know, what, what's happening in Italy. So a lot of information here, yes. Um, better than we were five weeks ago, Alan, if I can um, put it that way. But I'm sure John will have to, to add to that. Um, Happily. John, what's your take on it so far? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure what your question was directed at, but if it, the numbers Car Sharon has just given you, they, they are, they're showing a slight downward trend, but it's, it's inconsistent across Italy. So it's, it's early days to say that we're on, um, on a downward stretch. From an economic standpoint, we, we just have no idea what's happening and there aren't any signs of... Um, improvements or when we're when we're going to come out of this it's, it's really so difficult at the moment 
So you've been in lockdown two and a bit weeks more than we have. What, what are your tips for uh, for surviving it from a personal point of view, but also from you know business point of view, John? First of all, well, um, as as Boris said, uh, uh, poor chap who's in intensive care at the moment, but you're about two weeks behind us. So I think you, you, you're basically at where we, where we are. The first lockdown we had in Italy was on um, February the 24th when, when 10 towns in Lombardy and one town in Venice had a total uh, lockdown. And, uh, it, you know, I'm embarrassed to say this, but ever since then, we've been playing catch up. We've never been ahead of the game. And uh, I, that's what I've been telling my colleagues in the rest of Europe uh, and, uh, and around, around the world. I mean, I'm embarrassed, to be quite honest, embarrassed to say that on the, on the 24th of Monday, those, uh, the, Monday, the first Monday, those people that decided to stay at home, we called them up and told them to get into the office. <laughs> we didn't, because we really didn't appreciate the severity uh, of the thing. And then as Sharon was saying, on March the 9th, we had the, uh, the Lombardy lockdown. I was actually in Edinburgh it was, uh, watch, to, watch the, um, the, uh, to watch Scotland beat uh, France, which is probably the, my only highlight of the past four weeks. Um, and um, I, I, even on the 9th, um, we obviously decided that we would be closing the offices. Um, some people still, still kept coming into the office, but then the decision was taken away from us by Thursday because landlords were shutting the building. We couldn't, we couldn't get in. So we've always been playing catch up. Um, and I still think we're playing uh, catch up to a certain extent. And I, just, I, I think you're probably at the same point we are now where most people are, uh, are working from home. Most people uh, are having difficulty doing the shopping. They can only go to the supermarkets and, and the chemists, all of the, activities are closed so at the moment we're pretty much i think in the same same position so it's difficult for me to give advice i was telling my colleagues in europe two or three weeks ago be careful because it's going to be taken out of your control but but um we're beyond that point now so i think you are where we are but you're still on the upward curve <laughs> And Sharon, looking at the business side of things uh, in terms of a survival guide for that, what, what are your kind of um, guidelines for, for businesses over here in, in Glasgow and Scotland? I mean, absolutely. We had to, you know, um, it was a first for anybody and we had to start kind of writing, you know, the, the, the guidelines. And, and the, nice, the nice thing, dare I say, that's come out of this is for once Italy has been held up as an example and you know, being the vanguard of you know, and a template of what to do in, in such a situation. But you know, we were literally learning on the hoof and personally, um, and I'm glad I don't work for John because I decided on the 24th of February, um, when they announced this initial kind of limited lockdown in these towns south of it, south of Milan, sorry, I decided that day which was a Sunday, and really in the back of what my teenage kids were saying, I decided not to go into my office on the 24th of February because it is city centre Milan and there's a lot of traffic, a lot of international traffic, you know, and um, I made the decision not to go. I invited my team to do the same. I said it was entirely up to them. They also chose not to go into the office. So from the 24th of February, in fact, we then we self-isolated, not knowing what was down the line. And I um, I've mean, been a practicing lawyer in the truth for a long time, but I set up my own business on the 1st of January this year. <laughs> Little did I know of the tsunami that was going to hit me. Um, so I've been in business literally for three months. But you know, we did a seamless transition literally on the same day between working in the office and working from home. Fortunately, one of the decisions that, you know, you look back and you think that was a key decision and it was the right one. I, we decided to invest, albeit we're a startup, in a very um, state-of-the-art practice management system. And basically that runs our business from start to finish, from taking on clients to billing them. Um, and it's all done digitally. So we have all our files um, everything is online and any of us can work from anywhere. And in fact, I'm based, I live on, on Lago Maggiore, which is um, Arona, which is 60 kilometers northwest of, of Milan. 
My fellow partner in, in this adventure, Marco Tesoro, is now based in London because that was where he got stuck. And my other um, colleague is based in her home in, in Milan. The clients have noticed no difference at all to how we run our business. Um, so that is, has been you know, the upside. Um, the, the downside is, you know, I'm an employment lawyer. I offer advice to international companies who have businesses in Italy. So we do all the hiring and firing, disciplinary procedures. Um, we do um, employment, you know, parts of merger and acquisition. We do restructuring, collective redundancy. But of course, you know, we was a flurry of activity and giving initial advice to, to, to international businesses. And basically they were to get people to work from home as much as possible and to get people to use up their, their accrued holidays, you know. Um, but other than that, you know, it was um, a case of um, kind of wait and see and we're now five weeks down the line. Um, it's a challenge, you know, it's absolutely a challenge. Fortunately, the, the government, and Alan, do inter interrupt me if I'm um, giving, you know, running on too much. But, you know, the, the Italian government stepped in very quickly for cut for businesses. And what they did was they extended across the whole um, industry of businesses a system that was already in place in Italy. So we have um, these state measures for temporary layoff, but generally limited to manufacturing. That was rolled out immediately across all businesses nationally. And that gave companies um, a breathing space, so it immediately helped them with the people. Yep. Yep. And that took nine weeks, nine weeks. Um, to put people in furlough. However, an important condition attached to that, whether or not the companies took, take up these measures, you cannot dismiss anyone in Italy for economic reasons during this period and up until the 16th of May. If I could just come in there very quickly, um, as Sharon was saying, Italy has become the example um, for other countries. Curiously, both in the UK and in other European countries, the furloughing indemnification is 80% of salary, which has been the standard Italian um, indemnification for the past 30, 40 years. So I think we were leading there. If, if, if there's anything that can be comforting uh, for the UK businesses who may be in the same um, legal business as, uh, as, as I am in, like Sharon, I have five offices with 350 people. Um, and some people won't like to hear this, but the lawyers might. Our business in March it ha ha has not suffered. We're still, we're still on target uh, to complete March numbers in terms of revenues and work uh, that we had set out originally. Obviously, in the airport, it's a disaster. We've lost 90% um, of our, our flights, and we've got uh, 2,500 people laid off, and we have absolutely no idea when that business is becoming back. But all of our workers are taking advantage of the 80% indemnification that Sharon mentioned. Yeah, those are frightening numbers, John, actually. A couple of uh, questions have come in. One from uh, Neil Amner to everyone. Hi, how well prepared were you? Did you have a business continuity plan in place beforehand? And what have you learned to quote uh, Sharon there on the hoof uh, over the last few weeks? So that's one for you both. And Antonia, Antonio Speccia, um, not so much a question, just an observation. I think nobody was prepared but Taiwan and South Korea. We have to admit that. Um, so so on, on the point that Neil made, um, John, you know, how well prepared were you? I noticed a wry smile on your face there. Well, I mean, as I said before, I mean, we, we were playing catch up. We weren't at all uh, prepared for this. Um, uh, uh, well, I don't think anybody in Italy at the, uh, at the time in February, the, in February the 24th had any idea of the extent of the contagion uh, in Italy. And so as in the UK and other countries, the lockdown really came uh, came rather late. Okay, um, I would you know I think he's right. Taiwan, South Korea, but Hong Kong has done even better. You know, Hong Kong has one thousand eight hundred cases in a, in a country of eight million people, and they have forty four deaths. Okay. Uh, so the, I, you know I think they've done they've done really well. What have we learned? Well, um, I can tell you what I've learned, but it's not necessarily representative given my age and and the fifty five years I've been 
in, in business. I thought uh, prior to going into this, that the only way of communicating with people was with FaceTime. In the meantime, I've, I've had to learn Zoom, Team, Hangout, Skype for Business, House Party. And every, and every time I try and hook on, as I was earlier for this, I'm switching between my iPad and my PC because if one of them works, the other one doesn't. So uh, that's what I've learned. And uh, it's now, as Sharon was saying, it's now a month we've been working like this. Um, I have to say uh, it's worked in, 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 the, in the legal and tax business, it's worked extremely well, okay? Um, the, the, the morale is high. In some ways, people have become more efficient. Uh, I found curiously in these, in these um, video meetings that who physically was aggressive is calm, who didn't participate is now participating. Those that had difficulty expressing themselves physically in a physical meeting were coherent and clear <laughs> in the video meeting. So it's been, it's been a huge uh, learning experience. And I think when we go back, when we do get back to normality, we're not going to be working in the same way, yeah. same way again. Everybody's just got used to this and the people are hooking up on a daily basis, both to keep contact and it's broken down some of, you know, we, I, as I said before, we have five offices in Italy. It's broken down some of the territorial bar barriers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Italians are very provincial um, uh, in looking after their own mm -hmm. orchard and their own region. And you know, that's been a, a positive, positive aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, there has been, there is a revolution in progress here in Italy because Italy was, wasn't such an early adopter of the concept of working from home, or as they call it, smart working, agile working, because it was this idea of mm, working from home, a perception of, well, they're, they're very much into presenteeism in Italy, so, you know, in your office, eight hours or whatever. There's been a revolution and there's no turning back that tide now. You know, people will be looking completely differently at the way they work once this is all over and saying, why would I have a three hour round, you know, trip commute when I can do it from home? And as John said, learning, I mean, and as a certain age, you know, learning all this technology for the first time and all these words that now my kids are impressed that I know what Zoom means and what all the other um, terminology means, and I can use Use it you know and um, so that's been an upside and you know we should feel proud of that but also as John says people are you're seeing you're seeing the best of I'm seeing the best of people you see the worst in other situations but I am seeing the best in people and that is so heartening you know and you won't lose that going forward you know it'd be interesting to hear from others on the on the, the webinar actually about that attitude shift that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Sharon and John are talking about because certainly in the in the UK and, and I think John alluded to it there. Sorry, Sharon alluded to it there. In Italy, there's this uh, feeling that you have to be present to be doing your job. You know, present in the office. And I certainly remember bosses of mine in, in in past when you suggested that you were going to work from home. They looked at you as if you were insane and and just going to be slacking, watching the telly with your slippers on. So. It'd be interesting to know from the group whether or not that's a, an attitude that, that anybody else thinks might now be, you know, be, be, be walked back and, and actually we'll look at people who are working from home as actual workers as opposed to slackers. Let me just ask a question here from Angela Mathis. Uh, there's lots of questions coming in, so I don't want to lose this one. Um, Angela says, UK is offering SMEs of £40 million turnover, 12 months guarantee on loan interest up to £250,000. Is this enough and not just going to shift the bankruptcy cliff one year out? <laughs> John, well, I'll leave that to you. Well, I mean, I, I, I follow the, the UK news every day and um, I think it's um, laudable what the UK government has introduced as um, mechanisms to safeguard the small businesses and in, including this um, this loan guarantee and um, from what I can see it's uh, and, and I'm not it's not a criticism I uh, coming from the financial sector I can understand this it's gonna it's taking a bit of time to get the procedures in place as to exactly what does this mean and how do you get access to the money I the journalists on the on television and radio will obviously always exaggerate worst case scenarios but you will have heard as well as I have 
people being asked to give personal guarantees and paying 16, 18, 20% interest on these loans. The procedures haven't gone through yet, but I think it's, a, it's, an, it's an excellent initiative. We've had something similar, I think, this morning, haven't, haven't we, Sharon? Yeah, yeah. From, the, from the Italian government. They're gonna, so whereas with the, the furloughing, the UK, let's say, tended to copy, or didn't, not, didn't necessarily copy it to Italy, but it put in place something we already have. It looks like Italy is going to do something like that the UK government is putting in place. But, you know, 50,000 pounds for some businesses is going to be a lot of money. 50,000 pounds for another business is just not going to be adequate. Uh, if we couldn't, um, if we don't have, find a way of surviving in the, in the airport with the ground handling business, I mean, we do 70% of the ground handling at the two Milan airports of Malpensa and Lunate. Uh, 50,000 pounds won't do, wouldn't do anything for us. And we're facing bankruptcy if, uh, if something doesn't happen, as is the whole of the aviation industry. Yeah, how bad could that get, John? Because we, we hear horror stories. I think uh, I was speaking to you yesterday. You are saying that Ryanair is the only carrier with any planes in the air. Is that, is that about right? Yeah, Luft, Lufthansa still has a few flights. EasyJet has grounded everything. Um, uh, Ryanair has 20 flights a day against 2,500 flights in a normal situation. So they're, they're running 1% of, of their flights. And Ryanair is pretty solid, uh, as, we, uh, as we all know. So is the EasyJet pretty good, pretty fin uh, financially strong too. But most of the other airlines, are, uh, they're, they're running on a shoestring. Okay? And the, I, I don't see how they can survive. Here's one from Neil McCallum, um, Sharon, for you. Do you think your offices will be too large when you go back now home working is a thing? <laughs> that is the very question that's been running through my own mind. I've been mulling over with my, my partner. Um, so I think, so as personally, I think we always want to have um, you know, a city centre office, maybe in a, maybe kind of downsize it, but I think a huge number of people will be looking at their premises in city centre Milan, which are obviously very expensive, and downsizing without a doubt, particularly businesses that are in this kind of co-working arrangement whereby you're only, you know, you're only in it for a year or six months, so you've got the option to renew or not to, and I think there, these companies like Regis and we work or whatever will have difficulty with a lot of the renewals absolutely because I mean I personally been working from home a couple of days a week for a long time you know and I have to say that doing it now full time from home I do miss a bit of the game to Milan and the buzz and seeing colleagues so that complete move to only home working no but there will be a reduction I think in the taking on of commercial premises in the, in the city centres not just limited to Milan but London New York and all the other um, big business hubs in the world, yeah. That, that's a very astute question from, from Neil. Maybe mm -hmm. while I, I, uh, I answer, I'd be interested to know what business sector he's in, okay? Um, because we're discussing that at a European level at the moment. I mean, as I said myself, our, our business, the way we do our business is going to change because of this, okay? I don't know exactly what's going to happen yet, but that's a question we're already asking. Do we need all these offices around the world? Well, Colin Lamb adds to that. He's saying, I think more businesses will see working remotely as acceptable going forward. Some of our clients are even experiencing higher levels of productivity by working from home at the moment, which is really, really interesting, actually. And, and it could rewrite the map, actually. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Richard Muir, what's John's view of the future of world aviation industry? What will it look like in three, six or 12 months? And when might business people be able to fly into Milan? <laughs> As it's somebody who's missing Milan. <laughs> Quite right, too. It's a beautiful place. Um, well, I, I always say whenever I make assumptions and a hypothesis and forecast, 999 out of a thousand I get wrong. So I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. We don't, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a question we ask every day. What's going to happen when uh, planes are taking off again? Is everybody going to jump on a plane and go to Florence and Palma de Mallorca to celebrate the fact that they've got their newfound freedom? Or is it going to take months for people to get back, back together again? Personally, and this is a very personal view, uh, I hope it's an opportunity for the airline industry to get its act together because it's a, it's a business that treats customers with disdain. There's a, in my own opinion, there's a very poor uh, 
customer relation uh, management. I'm a, I'm a gold card holder of British Airways and it's disgraceful the way um, they treat the customers. I hope it's an opportunity for them to get their act together and not treat, treat us like uh, packages and that people pay the right pr price for uh, the service, the transport that, uh, that they get and that this filters down all the way through the people like us that do the baggage handling, the check-in, the bus transport, the cleaners, and everybody else, the caterers, who today are really treated very badly. That's interesting. Uh, Ruth Allen, many thanks for this and all these valuable insights. Many are predicting uh, that things will not be the same in many respects when we come out of this crisis. What do you think will have changed, Sharon? I think you've kind of covered that um, earlier on. Ben McCorkadale, do you agree that without a euro-wide or even worldwide economic coordinated approach to rebuilding markets, few countries will be able to avoid an extended depression post lockdown? That's a, a scary thought actually, but one that uh, I guess is exercising a lot of minds at the moment. Sharon. Day. Is going to but I think um, we okay. I think we're just losing Sharon's feet for a little bit. John, we, could you step in and, and maybe give us an answer to that? Well, although I'm old, I wasn't around at the, at the time of the Second World War, but uh, uh, I was there shortly afterwards. I, I everybody's talking about this being uh, being a war. I don't see any alternative to countries just stepping up the national debt to get the whole uh, the, the world economy uh, going again um it's much more integrated today than it than it was uh, 70 80 80 years ago so it has to be i would you know it's an intelligent question i think it has to be a worldwide effort to make sure that we get out of this otherwise well every there are a lot of people saying we're going we're facing a depression anyway so how long we stay in that depression depends on the coordination between the countries and um, uh, national governments um, getting into debt to, to finance it. I don't see any alternative. But I'm not an economist. I'm just a bean counter. <laughs> One question that seems to have been there coming up, um, John and Shan, when you come back on, uh, is... is on social media, certainly, a lot of people are su suggesting that uh, we should be doing stuff as businesses, we should be doing stuff for free uh, to help everyone out. But, I mean, the economy's teeter in the edge of the cliff as it is. If, if everything was done for free, it's just going to be the final push to push it over, is it not? There has to be some sort of, um, you know, coordinated approach to, to understanding that, yes, people need help, but at the same time, you can't stop charging for things. And maybe people are unwilling to actually say that out loud. Yeah. Can you hear me now, Alan? My. Yes, you're there. You're there, yeah, Sharon. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No, this is a this is a good point, and obviously we've had to, to deal with this firsthand. So, fortunately, um, I have a lot of very nice clients, and they have not been asking for free advice. And in fact, some of them have actually said, <laughs> "We do expect to be charged for this." Having said that, obviously, in a downturn, you look at other opportunities, which we have been given um, by some global law firms that we act for because they don't have offices in Italy, and they've asked us to contribute to publications um, to help people, for example, example manage their, their payroll or reductions in payroll over the, over the period. And we have happily, you know, a couple of hours of work, and we've happily done that for free in that we're getting great exposure and we're getting our brand, which is new and small, um, linked up with a very important global brand. So I see there's a business value in there and I, I'm more than happy to do that. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so the pro bono is, is, is important, obviously, in, in certain terms, and it's strategic. Yeah. I think that yeah. there are two aspects of this. One is, um, are we prepared to make sacrifices to help, uh, help the community, whether it be charities or hospitals or whatever, in this particular period? And the answer to that is clearly yes. We will do, we will do work for free if it helps the community um, as a whole. Uh, on a business standpoint, um, we're, we're taking on on a case-by-case -case basis. There are, there are some com companies which are obviously facing huge difficulties at the moment. <laughs> One is my airport business. Uh, they need help to get out of the situations, which is not just 
not just how to handle the costs of the workforce. Um, we've already got um, customers cancelling contracts because of force majeure. Okay, uh, is it force majeure? Probably yes, but uh, they need help to de defend themselves on that. And we'll, we'll we'll look at it on a case by case basis. Um, we'll we'll help you today, obviously, if if, if it means we establish a relationship and we get something in in, in the future. But not uh, we're not prepared just to do work for free, just for the sake. Mm -hmm of the climate we're in because I've still got to pay the salaries of my people. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for some raised hands as well, uh, guys who are on the webinar. If you've got a question for uh, 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 John or Sharon, raise your, raise your hand as well. I'm reading a few off the, the chat box at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. James Conroy as a gold card holder with BA. I couldn't agree more with John. Let's mm -hmm. leave it there. Uh, Neil McCallum, what is the Italian open up strategy? Do you know it? Uh, and Anthony McCallum, Karen, I'm looking to export whiskey to Italy. When do you believe the economy will get back to work? Italians stop in the summer, especially August, like in France. Are we now talking September? Okay, so we have at the moment, as we mentioned, we have the lockdown till the 13th of April, but we all know that that's not going to, that will be extended. The question is how long will it be extended? And obviously, you know, they're saying, could it be beginning of May, middle of May, end of May? We have no idea and we're waiting with bated breath to find that out. But regardless, it will be a phased approach as and when it happens, you know, will it be by age? Will it be by, you know, people who've had the virus if the testing then comes through to tell us that? But it won't be business as usual for a long time. And I think apropos the August the traditional Italian August holiday will disappear this year in that if we get up and running by then people will be more than keen to get up and out and work you know people even I'm missing my four-hour commute I mean people want to work now you know it's brought back that energy of let's get out and recreate you know they get the economy up and running so I think August this year for Italians will not be a holiday month hopefully we might be back working by then I, that's the same sensation uh, I have as well. They're, they're keen to get back to work. I don't think August is going to be a, a holiday month uh, this year. I, I, I missed the name of your, your questioner there, uh, Russell. But it, as a, it was uh, Anthony McCallum Karen. Great name for a whiskey man. Okay. As, a, as, as, a con as a keen consumer of our national product and an investor in the Lochranza Isle of Arran distillery, I'd be happy to help in any way that he wants to get his product into Italy. <laughs> Connie Young, how are you supporting your people and communicating with them? That's yeah. a very mm -hmm. important point, I guess, from a yeah. mental that, health perspective. Yeah, that's absolutely key is, you know, is protecting your reputation and looking after your people and doing the right thing by people, you know, be it your employees, your suppliers, whatever, you need to do the right thing and, you know, communicate, communicate and not just be positive, but be optimistic, you know, that there is an after and we'll all get through this. Yeah. Um, there's another a point from James here, James Conroy. Clearly, the real political challenge will be to rebase the tax arrangements of the largest global corporations. Aggressive tax avoidance by the online uh, corporations now also eyeing major opportunities in education and training is socially, politically, and economically unacceptable. That's an interesting point, actually. Will there be more uh, regulation and, and, and tougher regulation on companies like that? John, what's your view on that? Well, that, that's a tough one. I mean, I think as um, as everybody knows, there's been a lot of um, criticism uh, of the um, high tech companies, um, Amazon, Google, and all the rest uh, of of where they um, uh, locate their revenues. And there's the there's the BEPS project, which has been in course now, I think, for at least seven years, and it, it's it, it's a long it's a long process. I, I I don't know if this particular crisis is going to accelerate that, uh, but generating tax revenues for the future to repay the debt that I think all of us all the government should get into that I mentioned before is obviously going to be high on the list. So maybe it will accelerate the the BEPS procedure to to tax these companies in a different way. Do you agree with that, Sharon? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do businesses pick up 
when this pandemic's over? What, what, you know, do they just pick up from where they left off, or or will be, will there have to be some sort of gradual easing back in? Well, if you talk if you're talking about the airline business, uh, the handling business, then um, uh, my reaction is yes. We're going to have to make sure because. Uh, we uh, we we have regular training uh, processes. Not everybody realizes this, but airports are dangerous places, and we do we have a lot of safety and security issues where the people have to do uh, regular training. So we're going to have to get back up to speed with that um, uh, 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 as fast as possible. So that that's one of the things we're going to have to do. In 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 the legal and the business uh, legal and tax business, I think we have a lot more flexibility about how we react to clients needs and we can we can move pretty quickly based on what clients uh, want to do it's an interesting question i don't have all the answers yeah if, uh, richard's just uh, richard muse just uh, saying to everybody here if you want to ask a question by video just hover over the participants bar and press the raise your hand icon so let's let's get some video questions on we've had lots of uh, chat box questions let's get some video questions on as well. Sharon, would you echo what, what John's just said there? Yeah, and just add to that, and obviously in my own sector of, of law, you know, we as an international law firm, I travel a lot for business and, you know, wouldn't think twice about hopping on a plane, both in Europe and, and further afield to the States, um, and going to conferences with hundreds of people's cheek to jowl. I'll be thinking twice about that, you know, for the near future, how soon the conference circuit will, will, will take, will pick up again. I don't know. The signs are at the earliest later in the year, you know, conferences have been postponed until then, if not 2021, realistically. There's a, a, a story today running in the, the British press about a, 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 an event organiser, a woman who has been running her own business as an event organiser. Obviously, all her events are cancelled. Mm -hmm. And in order to keep paying her rent, she, or sorry, to, to have enough money, um, she is cancelling her, her contract with her landlord and moving into a hostel, working 20 hours volunteering uh, a, a, a week so that she can retain her savings. I mean, those are, those are examples of real hardship, aren't they? Absolutely, no, absolutely. Um, are you hearing things like that over in, in Italy? I guess you must be. Yeah, I mean, obviously we have a, I mean, obviously in any other country, we always have a problem of where do the homeless go when they can't self-isolate at home? Um, you know, but there's all sorts. I, mean, I still consider myself very fortunate, you know, um, and uh, probably most people on this on this webinar are in that category, you know, but it must be beyond hellish for some people. Yeah, and I think as John said, you know, if we're going to do pro bono, then we should be doing it for helping out that um, sector of the, of the population. I mean, just on that, John, you know, obviously one of the main tasks we face now is, is keeping people motivated, our, our workforce is motivated. Um, but looking forward, I mean, do either of you have any sense as to how sort of fragile people will be coming out of the other side of this? Well, I, I, again, I'd split it in uh, to the two businesses, the tax and legal business. Uh, morale, morale is high and it's easy to keep contact uh, with the professionals. It's, it's, and it's virtually on a, on a daily basis uh, at the moment between the various um, professional groups or according to their expertise. I'm not, I'm not terribly worried about that. And to be quite honest, myself and my, uh, my senior managers in the business, we, it, we found a little more time in, this, in, in these past few weeks to, uh, to connect with people, to call them. And, and to video conference with them. It's different in the airport, you know, we've got, we got two and a half thousand blue collar workers and it's, uh, we, we have our own internal news sites and we try and keep in touch, but it's, it, it's a much more difficult task. Sharon? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, it's that you're know, trying to keep positive and, and give a positive, positive message. But I think what will come out of this is people will be kinder to each other. <laughs> I can see that already, you know, and that's, that's only good. Uh, Francesco Rosso uh, has uh, put a message in the chat box. Will post-work socialisation with clients be any different if the future is working from home? <laughs> yeah. Interesting one. <laughs> I 
Well, I can tell you, I, all the clients I've spoken to on this uh, over the past two or three weeks, we've all promised each other we're going to go out and have one hell of a party. So I think there's going to be a, a whole a whole month of partying when we get over this this uh, this crisis. So, what about work, John? Sorry. What about work? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen after that? <laughs> Angela Mathis is asking, debt wipeout, do we need a Marshall plan? <laughs> One for the teenagers on board. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is an interesting point. You know, do we need some sort of a huge plan that is going to rescue the, the global economy? Or, or are we going to look at the economies you know, as, as, as a, from an individual country point of view? I guess we can't with globalization. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the expectation in Italy was quite disappointed, you know, with Europe, in that there wasn't this rallying immediately within the European Union. And in fact, you'll have seen the images where um, a, a group of Chinese doctors came over um, to Italy and brought with them 35 tonnes of equipment and thousands of masks and this and that. So that was very encouraging. But the, the feeling in Italy, who have always been traditionally a very pro-European country, I just saw a poll taken the other day and the Italians are becoming far less pro-European than they have been. And there was an article, I think, yesterday in the Financial Times saying the worry is that Italy after this may be looking twice at their position in the European Union, which would be, would be sad as, you know, Italy's the third biggest, you know, European, um, you know, country, um, largest European, third, Euro, largest European economy. So, and a big manufacturer. Well, I think this ties into the question we had before about um, does it need to have worldwide coordination? And I think the, uh, the Marshall Plan is a, is a reflection of that. I personally don't see any alternative. But as I said before, I'm just a simple bean counter. I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm not an economist. <laughs> I'm a simple lawyer. No, we, don't, <laughs> we don't have much time left, guys. A couple of minutes now just to take some last points. Um, uh, Connie Young has says, what type of businesses have you heard have been having the most difficulty in transferring work to home? Well, there, there's those obvious sectors where, um, you know, um, and we have a big manufacturing industry in Italy, so you can't start and you set up a production line in your kitchen if you were doing it last week at Fiat. So all those businesses where you need the actual physical person, and obviously the ones that are taking a big hit as well are all the, the service, you know, the, the restaurants, the cafes, the bars, all those industries, I mean, you cannot do it from home. What we have seen though just recently locally is um, businesses that didn't do takeaways have now, are now offering a takeaway service, you know, food services, so bringing your lunch and dinner, which is an initiative. They are closed, but they can cook and they can deliver. So the Italians, um, you know, have always been very innovative and very entrepreneurial, and, and you're, we're seeing that already, you know, and um, necessity is the mother of invention, I think, is, is, is what we say, and they're good at it. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that. I'm, obviously, the manufacturing industry is one of my clients is Rolex. They've stopped making watches. Uh, uh, we had hoped that if anybody, any of your listeners are Rolex watch fans, they will know that there's a, a huge waiting list for the majority of the Rolex watches. I had hoped that with this um, shutdown in the, in, in, in the shops, that the manufacturing uh, units would step up production and catch up on their on their backlog, but unfortunately, they're shut down as well. Uh, listen, guys, thank you so much for your input. Just before we finish, because we're running out of time, just give us an overview of, of where you see things going from now. First of all, with, uh, with you, Sharon. It's a whole new world. We have pushed the reset button, and you know, it's a whole new world. Who knows? John, last word. I, 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 the way we do work and deliver services to our clients is going to change. How it's going to change and to what extent I, is, is up in the air at the moment. But I think we're going to see big changes. Okay, well, look, I'm afraid that is all we've got time for today. Thanks so much uh, to our guests, Sharon Riley and John A. Stewart, for giving their time. And most importantly, 
uh, their experience of how the coronavirus pandemic has affected life and business in Italy, and of course their advice and what lessons we can learn here. Thanks also to everyone who joined us and took part. Your questions are what make the difference to webinars like this. And finally, uh, thanks to Glasgow Chamber of Commerce for putting this together. It's one of many really useful free webinars Alan Busby and the team at the Chamber are organising over the next few weeks, uh, looking at all sorts of issues that are affecting businesses. In fact, the next webinar is the now regular Wednesday Q&A with the Chamber's Chief Executive, Stuart Patrick. It starts at 3 p.m., uh, so remember to register for that. Stuart will outline some of the work the, the Chamber uh, has undertaken to proactively support business during this crisis, uh, as well as reflecting on the latest government announcements to support business. I'm Russell Walker. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see all of you and more of you on our next webinar. In the meantime, stay safe and stay well.